very warm welcome to worship. This week marks the second Sunday in Advent and the third week of the Methodist way of life. We will be exploring the theme of service together. But before we light the Advent wreath and sing an Advent hymn, let's take a moment to prepare ourselves. Be still. Notice what's going on in your surroundings and in your mind. Breathe deeply. Focus your attention on God. The God who is tangibly close. Who is there with you. Wherever you are. Be aware of God's presence. And rest in him. We gather to worship. I'm going to read the Bible from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. And it says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice or one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Voice, voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. We light the candle of hope. God will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many people. We light this candle to remember God's promise of peace. We can know peace if we turn away from sin and accept God's forgiveness. The world can know peace if we love and forgive each other. Let us pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace in company with all those who call on the Lord. Lord of holiness, your hand spans the heavens and your arm is outstretched and strong. You are beyond our understandings and outside our immediate senses. Yet your reality breaks in. Your majesty and power are reflected in the waterfall. Your steadfastness in the mountain peak and your shining beauty in the dewdrop and morning frost. We thank you. 
Lord of love, you came in Jesus to show how far you would travel with us. You are there in each act of our commitment, in every extra mile we travel, and in every selfless act. You walk with us in the breadth and variety of life, in every twinkling of an eye, and in every solemn and serious moment. We thank you. Lord of hope, you come ever closer to us to guide and curb, inspire and challenge, to comfort and disturb. You work with us to weave a pattern of life that pictures your glory. We adore you. In a moment of quiet, we offer you our thanks. Lord of all, in this season of Advent, we confess that we are too often innkeepers, for our hearts are too ready to cry, there's no room here. Forgive us. We want to be like shepherds who heard the angels and gathered in wonder and praise by the child. We confess that too often we are like Herod, fearful for our position status and influence forgive us we want to be like the magi who bowed and gave gifts we confess our tendency to look for value worth and meaning in the wrong places and to praise that which is not of you we take a moment to confess our ongoing need of god's grace and love the God who revealed himself in Christ as a loving and faithful God. We are accepted, forgiven, and loved. Give thanks. Amen. Oh
the reading is taken from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37, the parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. I'm here in a quiet corner of the Yorkshire Dales, perhaps one of my favourite parts of England, and walking along a path, an old road, perhaps the sort of road Jesus had in mind when he told the parable that we know of as the Good Samaritan, the parable where a man is walking along a road and set upon by robbers and left for dead. We'll come in a moment or two to, to think about that parable and think more about the context in which Jesus tells it as we think about our third Methodist way of life principle, that of service. In many ways, I feel I've been given the easiest theme to cover because surely as Christians, service and serving others is a given because that's what service is in this case. It's the service of others. But we must understand that as we serve others, we are also serving God. It is part of our service and witness to God. But we must also recognise that with serving others, there often comes the need to challenge injustice. Because when we serve and help others, we are often responding to and addressing a symptom of a problem rather than the cause of the problem itself. To put it in a different way, if a doctor only addressed the symptoms of an illness, then though it might give momentary relief to the patient, in the long term those symptoms would return. 
until the cause of the symptoms itself, until the problems were addressed. It's the same with serving others and with justice. We don't just address the symptom, but where necessary, we should be ready to challenge the cause. Otherwise, the symptoms will keep returning. So serving and seeking justice really are one package. They really should come hand in hand. But today I am specifically focusing on service and serving others. The need to serve ought to come from our desire to care, which Colin mentioned two weeks ago. But it's also linked to our daily service, sorry, to our daily worship and devotion, which Juliet covered last week. And I'll return to that a little later. So service does not stand alone and should not be seen in isolation or as an optional extra. It's no coincidence that service also appears in the five practices of a fruitful church that our circuit has been focusing on and will continue to do so. One of the five practices is risk-taking mission and service. The idea that churches, if they are to be fruitful, need to be involved in acts of service. One of the other five practices is extravagant generosity, which I also want to suggest can be seen as service. Serving, caring, helping, whatever you want to call it, should be in our DNA as followers of Jesus. Whether that's collectively, as what we do as a church, and the five practices can help us think about that, or whether it's what we do in our individual lives, and this is where the Methodist way of life can help us think about it. We ought to be a people who serve and help others. As I've said, it should be a given. To help us think about the theme of service, I could have chosen so many passages from Scripture. Whether it's the call of Abraham, where God says that he and his descendants must be a blessing to all people, or whether it's the Old Testament prophets and their repeated pleas for justice and inclusion for the widow, the orphan and the foreigner. Three groups that, in those days, represented the most vulnerable in society and the most likely to be excluded and left behind. I could have gone to one of the epistles or the pastoral letters in the New Testament. 1 John 3 uh, verses 17 to 18 particularly spring to mind. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? It goes on, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. Or from the Gospels, I could have chosen so many passages, perhaps one of the healing miracles, healing being by its very nature an act of service. Or I could have chosen and highlighted the way Jesus responds to needing and the feeding of the 5,000. I could have gone to Matthew 20, 28, where Jesus says of himself, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Or I could have turned instead to John chapter 13, where Jesus takes on the role of a servant, a slave even, and washes the disciples' feet, and then tells his disciples that they must do the same. Or I could have turned to Matthew 25 and the parable of the sheep and the goats where we hear Jesus say to those he describes as righteous, whatever you did for the least, you did for me. As I will now say for a third time, service of others should be a given. It shouldn't even be questioned in our Christian witness and service. So you know what? I'm going to take it as a given. I'm going to take it that you already know that you need to serve. I'm going to take it that you don't want another sermon from someone telling you why you should serve or why you should help. Because if you haven't got it by now, you're probably not going to get it. So instead, I'm going to use this passage from Luke chapter 10, which was read for us, to help us think about what should drive and motivate our service, and to help us think about exactly who we should serve. And as I hope we shall discover, 
those questions and answers are very closely linked. Out of all those passages I've mentioned and all the others I could have chosen, to help us think about serving, I chose this well-known passage where Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I chose it because of its context. Here we see a teacher of the law, an educated man, someone who would have known the answer to his question, come to Jesus and ask, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So the man's question is about life. Jesus, though, does what Jesus often does, and he doesn't give a straight answer. Instead, he replies, what's written in the law? What do you read there? It's almost as if Jesus is saying, well, I'm not going to give you a straight answer. Tell me instead what you think. So this teacher of the law, this educated man, gives his answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbour as yourself. Jesus says to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. In other words, do this and you will have that eternal life you asked about. But the way Jesus spoke about eternal life, it wasn't just about life after death but it was something tangible for that moment, something real, abundant and joyous. So Jesus is saying, love God and love neighbour, and you will discover this abundant, wonderful, joyous life, for now and for all eternity. But the man isn't done. He asks a follow-up question. He asks, who is my neighbour? I find myself wondering what lies beneath this question. Whether what he's really asking is, who is not my neighbour? In other words, in the context of what's gone on before, is he really trying to find out, who can I not love? Who can I ignore? Who can I not serve? Who can I choose not to help? Because... If we're honest, I think we all ask that question on some level, consciously or subconsciously. Whether we like it or not, the truth is that we all judge people as being worthy or unworthy of our help. And I wonder if that is what lies behind the question, who is my neighbour? You've only got to read some of the headlines or articles in our tabloid newspapers or listen to some of the headlines or radio phone-ins or read some of the stuff posted on social media and you discover how we as human beings are quick to judge others as being worthy or unworthy of our help. Why should I help them, we cry. Whether it's people saying the government shouldn't be feeding hungry children because it's the parents' responsibility. Or others suggesting that perhaps we shouldn't help people who are hungry because they all waste their money on cigarettes, alcohol and satellite television. The mind boggles at such heartlessness and sweeping generalisations. And I become incredibly disheartened by the general lack of human empathy we see in our world. But then I realise that, if I'm honest, I do it too. Perhaps not on those issues, but on others. If I'm honest, I judge, and I bet you do too. Then I realise that when I'm pointing the fingers at others and criticising their judgement, I ought to be looking in the mirror. It's my place to love first and God's place to judge in his grace and in his love. The truth is that we see people in need of help, we see people we could serve, and we all make judgments about who we feel is worthy and unworthy of our time, energy, resources and service. In other words, we all make judgments about who is worthy of our love. 
Part of the problem I've come to realise is that we see people and the world around us through a number of different lenses. The lenses of our experience, our education, our cultural norms, our inherited values, our family values, our political viewpoint, our faith viewpoint. All these things are so ingrained in us that we don't even realise how much influence they have on us. So they each play their part in what goes on in our subconscious mind. And we end up judging. We decide. We put ourselves forward as both judge and jury. What arrogance on our part. But it seems it's part of our human nature. It's part of the condition we live in called sin. Who is my neighbour? Morning. Who is my neighbour? Who is not my neighbour? Who should I love? Who can I not love? I think that's what the man was asking. And honestly, I think we are all asking those questions at different times. So Jesus tells a story. And it's the story you all know. It's a story about a man who was walking along a road. It's a story about how that man is attacked and robbed and beaten and left for dead. It's a story about how two religious types who should have known better, whose faith should have told them to do better, two religious types who might have believed the right thing, but yet who still passed by. And it's a story about how a Samaritan, in other words, a foreigner, an outsider, someone who was unclean and someone who would have not normally been accepted in the, in the religious communities of that time. It's a story about how he is the one who stops to help. He is the one who goes above and beyond. He is the one who serves and he is the one who demonstrates what it is to love your neighbour. It turns the expectations of the hearers on its head. And at the end, Jesus asks the question, which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Then this educated man, this expert of the law said, the one who had mercy on him. In other words, the one who did something the one who practised what he preached, the one who acted. Remember Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats, whatever you did for the least, you did for me. So Jesus concludes, go and do likewise. The man had asked Jesus, who was my neighbour, but did you notice that Jesus didn't answer the question? But instead, he seemed to turn it around. In saying, go and do likewise, he seems to be posing a question back to the man. The implied question being, who will you do likewise to? Or, who will you be a neighbour to? Or to put it another way, whose neighbour are you? We have to go back and remember that the story was told in the context of the man asking about what he needed to do to have eternal and abundant life. And remember that when Jesus asked him what he thought, he said, you had to love God and love neighbour. It's no coincidence that those two commands appear together as they belong together. But it always starts with loving God. If we truly want to love our neighbour, then it starts with loving God. It always starts with loving God. Everything we do as the people of God should start with loving God. Because the more we love God, the more we seek God, the more we let God work in us, the more time we spend with God through worship and daily prayer, the more learning we do from God and with God. The more we are in that daily relationship, the more we yield and surrender and allow ourselves to be changed by God's love and in God's love, 
then the more we will love our neighbour. Then we will start to see people, not through our own lenses that bring about judgment and our sense of who is worthy and unworthy, but in loving God, we will start to see people through the lens of God's love. If you want to see in love, then you must live in love. It's not rocket science. If you want to see people through the lens of love, then you must live in love. And that starts with God. Then the answer to who is my neighbour becomes obvious. It's anyone, it's everyone, because God loves everyone. There is no one we can legitimately not love in the name of God. By loving God and living in love, we are simply more likely to respond in loving service. So love is both our motivation and our reason to exclude nobody. But let's be honest, faith isn't always that easy. The experience of God isn't always that real. So when we're struggling to see through the lens of God's love, when God feels distant or our prayer life is a struggle, then what do we do? Well, I believe that's when we need to be more aware of our own thinking and thought processes. We need to be aware enough to ask in each situation, not what is my default response, but what is the Christ-like response? What is the godly response? We are, after all, all responsible for our own words and actions. More self-awareness might also help stop our sinful default judgments. To confirm then, who is my neighbour? Who can I serve? What is our motivation to serve? Love God and love neighbour. Love is both our motivation and our reason to include everybody. Now I want to finish by saying I don't want anyone to feel guilty today. I don't want this to be a sermon where you go away feeling that you have to do more. We have to acknowledge that we can't respond to everything and everyone and every need. But we must recognise that we can't serve on every occasion. But also that we must do something. We can't let too much need and too many opportunities to serve become a reason for doing nothing. Sometimes we feel overwhelmed by the vastness of the world's problems that we just don't know where to start so we just don't bother. That can't be an excuse. Not in the love of God. Instead, whatever it is that you are passionate about, whatever it is that God lays on your heart, then start there and see what happens. And trust that God might have laid other needs and other acts of service on someone else's heart. Because God is bigger than us and works in mysterious ways. And it goes without saying that when it comes to serving, our question should never be, what's the minimum I can give? Or what's the least I can get away with? Because that question comes from the same place as the question, who is my neighbour? It's seeking to avoid. Instead, when we do feel that motivation from God's love, then we must respond as generously as we can. So I encourage each and every one of us to be a people who seek to do the things that keep us grounded and rooted in God's love the things that Colin and Juliet have already spoken about so that we may discover a deeper less judgmental love for our neighbour and when we do respond with loving service May it be done with the generosity of our time, our resources, our energy and our money. In the knowledge that loving and serving neighbour truly glorifies and serves God and gives us real, abundant and joyous life too. It's not rocket science. Love God. Everything starts from there.
and in his blessing, the rest will happen. Amen. Justice, Savior to all, came to rescue the weak and the poor, chose to serve and not be served. Oh, Jesus, you have called us. Freely we've received now, freely we will give. We must go, live to feed the hungry, stand beside the broken. We must go, stepping forward, keep us from just singing, move us into action. We must go. Act justly every day, loving mercy in every way, walking humbly for you, God. You have shown us what you require. Freely we receive now, freely we will give. We must go, live to feed the hungry, stand beside the broken. We must go, stepping forward, keep us from just singing, move us into action. We must go. Fill us up, send us out. Fill us up, send us out. Fill us up, send us out, Lord. Fill us up, send us out. Fill us up, send us out. Fill us up, send us out, Lord. Stepping forward, keep us from just seeing. Move us into action, we must go. In this second Advent Sunday, let us bring our prayers to God about our world, our community and our churches. Towards the end, I'm going to say the Lord's Prayer, but I'm going to do that in my native language, which is Estonian. So let us pray. Father God, we thank you that you see everything and that you use people to better the bad situations in this world. Thank you that you always work behind the scenes. 
Father, we bring to you the suffering many are experiencing across the world, and we pray for governments that are making decisions for their people, especially in this coronavirus pandemic. Help them to be mindful of every human life in whatever circumstance, and help them to arrive at solutions that takes into consideration everyone's needs. Enable the government to grow in awareness of circumstances around them and rise up people who speak for justice and demonstrate love through their actions and words. Bring them forward so that they are heard. We ask that a decision would be made where coronavirus vaccine would be available to all people in every country of the world, whether they are in a house or on a street, whether they are seen or unseen by our eyes, whether they have means to live or live in poverty, whether they are somebody or a nobody, whether they are loved by us or not. In our community, we pray for people who are facing this period in life alone and help us to be curious who our neighbors are and wha what they need. Give us wisdom on how to help them and help us to reach out and learn through these situations about how you work through us and in us. We pray for all the initiatives that are happening during this Advent time and use us to respond when people reach out. We pray for children and young people in our communities who depend on good care. May they not go hungry or without shelter. May they know your love that brings hope. Help us not let any child in need to slip through our fingers. Prompt us to be aware and respond to their needs. For praying for our churches, I would like to use the breakthrough, thre uh, breakthrough prayer from the Methodist Church. It's a prayer for God to break through in the life of our churches. God of love, God for all, your purposes are more beautiful than we can possibly imagine. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and help us let go of all that holds us back. Open our lives and our churches to new seasons of humility and faith, of change and growth. Shake us up with the good news of Jesus and show us the way. And now the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray together. Me ei isa, kes sa oled taevas, pühitsetud olgu sinu nimi. Sinu riik tulgu, sinu tahtmine sündigu nagu taevas nõnaga maa peal. Meie igapäevast leiba anna meile täna päev ja anna meile andeks meie võlad, nagu meiegi andeks anname oma võlglastele. Ja ära saada meid kiusatusse, vaid päästa meid kurjast, sest sinu päralt on riik ja vägi ja au igavesti. Aamen. Colors of day go into the mind The sun has come up, the night is behind Go down in the city into the street And let's give the message to the people we meet So light up the fire and let the flame burn Open the door, let Jesus return Take seeds of his spirit Tell the people of Jesus, let his love show. Go through the park, on into the town. The sun still shines on, it never goes down. The light of the world is risen again. The people of darkness are needing a friend. So light up the fire and let the flame burn. Open the door, let 
Jesus return. Take the seeds of His Spirit, let the fruit grow. Tell the people of Jesus, let His love show. Open your eyes, look into the sky. The darkness has come, the sun came to die. The evening draws on, the sun disappears. But Jesus is living, His Spirit is near. So light up the fire and let the flame burn. Open the door and let Jesus return. Take seeds of His Spirit, let the fruit grow. Tell the people of Jesus, let His love show. May the sun of righteousness shine brightly with you and through you. May you be rooted and grounded in God's love. May you serve with generosity and may you bear witness that you may have life abundant. And may the blessing of our wonderful God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.